Welcome everyone to uh, to the garden and the dump to our our two day conference on uh, the multitude of ways of seeing, uh, thinking, and living ecology through visual art, cinema, magic, and philosophy. Um, while the multitudes of uh, approaches to seeing uh, has uh, been severely reduced through the past uh, 18 months that we've been planning this conference, we are nevertheless extremely pleased to see you all here. So over the next two days, you will hear from our invited speakers from uh, across a wide range of disciplines and geographic backgrounds. Uh, so please do stay with us for the whole conference. Um, there'll be a lot to absorb, to discuss, and hopefully to, to take away and process and not just dump uh, once the event is over. And please do uh, stay engaged uh, as we'll have a Q&A session after each of the talks. Uh, you'll be able to ask your question by using the Q&A section uh, that you can see in the bottom of your screen. And the moderator will then uh, reiterate the question for the speaker and everybody else. And this conference has been put together by the two of us. Uh, my name is Alia and my colleague, Nikolai Skiveren. And we are both PhD students at Aarhus University. And so the conference was made possible thanks to the very generous support of AU's PhD School of Arts, as well as the Human Futures Research Program and the Center for Environmental Humanities, to which we are very grateful. And as uh, Nikolai and I were discussing our proposed conference and this supposed juxtaposition uh, between gardens dumps, we started realizing that perhaps in our present condition, garden and dumps are not as rigidly different as we might think. And perhaps to think ecologically is to see that the gap between them is in fact very mysterious and slippery. And perhaps ecological thinking itself is or can be very slippery and ungraspable. Well, we are, however, infinitely thrilled to have uh, both Timothy Morton and Michael Marder uh, within our grasp tonight and uh, present. And uh, both of them are thinkers who have had a profound influence and served as an inspiration for both Nikolai and my own projects. And I'm sure this actually applies to a lot of people present here tonight. So we will kick off this event with a presentation by Timothy Morton followed by a response by uh, Jakob Lomberg. So Timothy Morton is a Rita Shio Goffey Chair in English at Rice University. They have collaborated with Björk, Laurie Anderson, Jennifer Walsh, Raf Hildjur Arna Dottir, Sabrina Scott, Adam McKay, Jeff Bridges, Justin Gualia, Ola Filia Eliasson, and Farrell Williams. Morton co-wrote and appears in Living in the Future's Past, a 2018 film about global roaming, roaming with uh, Jeff Bridges. They are the author of the libretto for the opera Time, Time, Time by Jennifer Walsh. Morton has also authored an impressive number of uh, works in eco-critical theory and environmental philosophy, including Being e Ecological, Humankind, Solidarity with Non-Human People, Dark Ecology for a Logic of Future Coexistence, Nothing, Three Inquiries into, in Buddhism, uh, Hyperobjects, Philosophy and eco Ecology at the end, After the End of the World, Realist Magic, Objects, Ontology, Causality, The Ecological Thought, Ecology Without Nature, and eight other books and 250 essays on philosophy, ecology, literature, music, art, architecture, design, and food. Morton's work has been translated into 10 languages, and in 2014, they gave the Wellick Lectures in Theory. And, uh, this is Timothy's latest book, All Art is Ecological. And as the back of it suggests, uh, Timothy Morton has been called the philosopher prophet of the Anthropocene. And when I read this comment, I immediately thought of um, one of my favorite books of late, Prophetic Culture by Federico Campagna. And uh, Campania has ever beautifully unravels his argument that when civilization like ours comes to an end, this is when the role of prophets becomes particularly urgent and necessary. Those who face the daunting task of rebuilding a world do not deserve that we consign to them the metaphysical formula of a civilization whose impact on the planet has been exceptionally catastrophic. It is better to invent from scratch a world song that never, that never was. And to 
um, and to consign it to those who shall come after the end of our own future. And I think we did have exactly such figure in team, and both for to aid the generations to come as much as that of our own uh, in this daunting task of world building and dreaming up the worlds to come. Jakob Wamberg is a professor at the Art History Department at Aarhus University. Wamberg's work spans an impressive number of subject areas that integrate perspectives from visual cultures, sociology, psychoanalysis, biosemiotics, and philosophies of nature and technology. Wamberg has authored an extensive number of articles, monographs, and anthologies, including the two-volume Landscape as World Picture, Tracing Cultural Evolution in Images, and as editor, Art and Alchemy, Totalitarian Art and Modernity, The Post-Human Condition, and Art, Technology, and Nature, Renaissance to Post-Modernity, and the Bloomsbury Handbook of Post-Humanism that came up last year. His present research concerns post-human aspects of modern art since the 1900s. He has chaired the collective research project Post-Human Aesthetics at Aarhus University, which investigates concepts of biotechnology and information science from the perspective of art history and philosophy. And we're very excited to have Wamberg respond to Tim's, Tim's keynote uh, today and to moderate the following discussion. And so uh, I guess all that's left to say is that we welcome you both and uh, I'll leave the floor to you, Tim. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor to be to be here. Um, and um, uh, lovely to see you again, Michael, um, work with you again. And um, thank you, Alia, for quoting my dear friend Federico's book. It's a very important book, I think. Um, and um, it's lovely to hear his, his sort of lapidary prose ringing out over the ether. And this, this lecture actually is called My Garden is a Dump. Um, because it is, <laughs> and I'm going to sort of explain why that's probably a good idea, politically and aesthetically. So um, first of all, though, I have to explain that I'm, people say that I'm a philosopher, you know, I, I, I wouldn't dare to call myself this term, yeah, but that's what people say, and, and, and when you think, you know, you, you hear this word philosophy and what you think it might mean, it's like having ideas, or in particular having big ideas, um, and there's plenty of people, um, especially, I think, with Y chromosomes, who might agree that it's about having really big ideas, you know, but I personally think philosophy is made of two emotions, the word um, love, yeah, that's kind of clearly an emotion, right, and w wisdom, if you had to choose between wisdom is an idea, or a set of ideas, or whatever, or some kind of fortune cookie situation, and an emotion, I think you probably choose the emotion, right, the, 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 the DOM at the end of the word, suggests that it's a feeling, right? So philosophy is actually two emotions. And the thing about emotions is that they're from the future. So like, why do you do therapy? Yeah, you do therapy because you're having a feeling that you don't understand yet, that you don't have the words for yet. So in a funny way, although of course the feeling is a symptom of stuff that happened to you, it's also from the future in a sort of phenomenological sense, right? And the, the ideas or the words or whatever are from the past, right? Ideas are from the past and feelings are from the future. So for example, I wouldn't write, I don't think the book, hyperobjects anymore, right? Because actually we've all got the hyperobject feeling, it's called coronavirus, um, and the feeling's always more important than the, than the word, actually. Um, so um, talking of feelings, I have a lot of feelings about, about my garden, you know, and the thing about um, stuff in the world is that it's also philosophy, right? Like the, another way in which philosophy isn't just ideas is that it's, it's embodied in things, right? Like the, the way you hold a door or the way you um, put a cup to your lips or the way you drive a car or don't drive a car or whatever, all these things are kind of incarnations of philosophy. It's not just in your head, right? Or as the, or as the, uh, FBI detective Fox Mulder used to say on the X-Files, the truth is out there. And uh, Slavoj Žižek has a very good number that he does here about toilets, right? Where he's talking about the difference between the French toilet and the German toilet and the Anglo-American toilet, you know, the, the difference between sort of rationalism and idealism and pragmatism and, and, and various sort of things like that. And, and, and I have the same thing going on about lawns. And one thing that you don't know about me is that the garden lawn, right, which is what I'm gonna be talking about mostly today, 
and why I profoundly resist this notion of, of lawn. And right now I can hear outside my, my front window lawn mowers and leaf blowers, and I'm hoping they're not doing my lawn because I'm going to get super upset and angry. I'm going to have to sort of run out and tell them to stop because I've sort of asked them and begged them and told them I don't do this. Um, but America is on automatic, right? It's an auto highly automated world in America, not just because of machinery, but because of the legacy of slavery, white supremacy. Um, it's not just, you know, mechanical metal plastic machines. It's human beings being treated as machines for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, you know, th there are these patterns that happen. And one of those patterns is that people do this lawn stuff. And I was teaching an architecture class a few months ago and I'd never taught about lawns before. And lo and behold, there was this super loud noise outside. And I get outside the front door and there's somebody driving around on one of these gasoline powered lawnmower things. Um, it, while I'm teaching about why there are terrible space of patriarchy and white supremacy and speciesism and should be resisted at all costs, you know, and I'm, I'm starting the association for the abolition of the American lawn. There was an association for the abolition of slavery. So why not have an association for the abolition of the American lawn. Unless you think these things are actually not connected, just try walking while black in America, right? Like there's plenty of rules in plenty of states that are called things like make my day. That's what it's called in Colorado, the make my day law. If you put a foot on someone's lawn, you, the person who owns it can shoot you dead. That's basically what's going on there. You know, your home is your castle, even though it's kind of small. And the lawn is an expression of your private property in public. Basically, that's what it is. It's like it's republicanism with a small r, right? And if someone dares to step foot on your property, your private property, and, and moreover, it's not just your private property. As Oscar Wilde would say, it's a symbol of your private property, and that's even more important. If somebody steps on that symbol, you can shoot them dead in plenty of states in the USA. So yeah, as we know, because of Black Lives Matter and blah, 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 Walking while black is a terrifying experience, right? And part of the life, right? The word life in Black Lives Matter is to do with, could we please just live, right? Like, like that phrase is from the future, right? It's expressing an emotion. Like, wouldn't it be great if that phrase was true? And I think the life here is not a biological concept of life, right? Like it's, it's not bios. And it's not a legal concept of life. It's not Zoe, right? Like, these things are alive and you shouldn't hurt them. And these things aren't really alive. They're just kind of machines. And that screaming noise they're making is just a mechanical screaming noise. That legal concept and that biological science concept are not the word life in Black Lives Matter. It's more, if you were going to go with the Greek word, the word thumos, which is actually the last syllable of the word rhythm. And if you say thumos, so you're ancient Greek, you're pointing here. Yeah. And it means pulsation or, 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 or palpitation. The fact that um, to be alive is to be moving, right? Like, like to be a kind of quantum thing is to be kind of shimmering and moving and also to be a life form, right? Is to be kind of that all by yourself without being pushed, right? The default art is called dance. Yeah, if you speed it up and make it a bit more mechanical, it's called drama and there's like a goodie and a baddie and all of a sudden you're invading the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. and you're trying to get the enemy, you're trying to hang Mike Pence and get Nancy Pelosi. Dance is less concept, right? And in a certain way, all art is dance. Um, you know, like when you read a poem, you're making your face and your voice kind of dance in a certain way, right? And the default dance is called being alive, right? You get up, you get out of bed, you put your face on, you put your toothbrush. It's kind of boring, but it's also dancing, right? It's, and then I think the default dance is called being asleep default life, right? Just being asleep, just kind of lie there. And this is where the thumos, you can see, right? That your body's just going vum, 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 and your dreams, right? Sort of your mind is rippling, whatever that is, right? And that's the life in Black Lives Matter. And that's also nonviolent direct action, right? Like when you let your body go sort of limp, you're just being alive in the street, Right, not in a legal sense or a biological sense, but just in a kind of please just let me go vum 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 sense, right? And that's what's being exterminated mostly in this concept of the lawn, right? Is this is this is this actual life, this palpitating life, right? Like actual life forms are supposed to be exterminated, right? 
flowers and insects and other life forms that are categorized as weeds and pests, aka life forms that we don't want to have in our garden, right? Only it's not very much of a garden, is it? It's really just a, the, like the minimal kind of private property expression. And when I showed up in Colorado, which is, you know, when I kind of accidentally moved to the USA, I couldn't believe everyone had to have these things in front of their house. And I was actually very disturbed by it because coming from, coming from Britain, it's not quite the same. And um, the closest I could think was like an Oxford College, which you know, is the building and the big flat lawn in front, or like a palace, right? Like Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. And it's this big palace. And in front there's this huge lawn. It's this void space, right? To kind of freak out people who are coming into it. Like this is our power and this is what we own. And this is like an abstract expressionist painting on the ground, right? It's like Barnett Newman painted everything in front of people's houses in America, right? And because of how, you know, people borrow from the past and they end up accidentally retweeting viral toxic memes, this idea that we should have lawns in front of our houses to express our, our, our private property in public, right, became the norm. And that's what I'm up against with this garden. Because right now, I'm doing what other British people are doing, and I, I didn't even realize I was doing it. I'm rewilding my, my garden, yeah? Um, in other words, I'm, I'm letting my garden just happen. And this is after this massive freeze. Texans are not used to the freezing. Like I live in the subtropical zone here, but a few uh, months ago, because of global warming, the Arctic came down to say hello, right? And everything froze and it was very, very disturbing. And, and not only that, but like a few days later, everything died, right? Everything went black and green and shriveled and just died. And I'm driving around Houston very upset because everything's just necrotized, right? So I just cut all my plants down to the very basics so that the roots and the fungi that are symbiotically connected to the roots, right, the mycorrhizae, they could li live in that thumos way, right? And a few weeks later, I was very pleasantly surprised by these things kind of coming back, right? So I just let it happen. I decided I'm going to experiment with, with not gardening. You know, so that's another way to describe my garden is that it's a not garden. You know, the, it's a N-O-T hyphen garden, but in a funny way, it's also a not garden, K-N-O-T garden, like in the Middle Ages sort of notion of, of a garden with a kind of intricate maze, because there's a way in which um, I'm entangled with this garden, right? And I'm just another life form in the garden, entangled with the other life forms that make up the garden. And I don't know whose fault it is doing this garden. The word rewilding is funny because it's what we call transitive, right? It's supposed to have a subject and an object, but I don't like this idea of subject and object, right? So like my friend, Denise Fer Ferreira da Silva published this book a few years ago, it's called Towards a Global Idea of Race. And she argues incredibly successfully that any subject-object duality is also a master-slave duality, right? And of course, it's an active-passive duality. Yeah. And I don't think we should be working with these terms anymore. And I don't think that's what's going on with me rewilding my God. I'm just sort of leaving it be, right? And so it's not really an active verb there. I'm not really doing anything. I'm just letting my garden happen. And there's no necessarily good verb for that, but we should try to think of verbs for that, you know, because gardening and art, as this conference so beautifully exemplifies, are actually going like this right now. And very soon, you know, because of the climate emergency, the, the, the Natural History Museum, you know, and the Art Museum, they're gonna be going like this, right? And I can't tell you how many art departments around the world have got like gardens they're doing and their, their main focus is uh, some kind of something to do with landscape, which is also a very toxic word, right? Because it's a anthropocentrically scaling what you're doing to look good to human beings. Yeah, I'm working with this landscape architecture program um, in Los Angeles, and we decided we would call it synthetic landscapes to get away from this idea. And we decided to say, well, you know, like ants are also synthesizing the landscape and, and uh, hedgehogs are synthesizing the landscape and roses are synthesizing the landscape. And it's not like a human being just working on a surface, right? And our slogan, which is basically trying to go up against two, 300 years of um, uh, the picturesque, 
right? Which is roughly how gardens are sort of framed, right? They should look good like a picture to a human being. And our, and our slogan is stop making selfies out of non-human beings, right? Because that's kind of roughly what we're doing a little bit with, with kind of conventional gardening. We're using them as a kind of reflection of us. And if you look at an old fashioned landscape painting, it's really a selfie, isn't it? But like inverted, you know, like if you read a romantic poem about a mountain, it's really about the poet or the narrator who's talking about the mountain, right? And it's the same with any kind of, so nowadays we all do this because we're all romantic poets and we put selfies on Facebook and stuff and we put photos of where we've been and they're just like scaled to the picturesque, right? It's an aesthetic scaling. And we even use the kind of fisheye lens in the, in the smartphone, there's often a fisheye lens to give you the widescreen thing. And back in the 18th century, they had the cloed glass, right? They had the sort of hemisphere of sepia colored glass and you get into a certain position, which was actually funnily enough, it was down and to the right, like the selfie is up and to the left and the landscape position, which is called repoussoir after the painter Poussin is down and to the right. And you look into your little uh, Claude glass named after Claude, but also the landscape painter. And you see upside down a beautiful sepia colored, looking like a watercolor painting image of the thing that you're looking at. Like, so you're looking at it as if it was a picture already. And so really there's a kind of subject object duality there, which is intrinsically a, a master slave duality with all kinds of implications like that, right? In America, it's also a kind of patriarchal problem. Yeah, because the lawn is a masculinity performance. You know, republicanism with a small r is about mowing and mowing in general is associated with the sort of death, you know, with the scythe and very, um, and, and that death figure is usually coded as masculine, right? And maybe in the 1600s, it was kind of interesting to write poems like Andrew Marvel, the English poet used to write about mowing as a form of like leveling down the aristocrats and the, and the monarchy so they could kind of operate in a more democratic way, right? But of course, this always implies sort of peasants or slaves or something, you know, it's not really functioning anymore, this idea of leveling things, this idea of level playing field, which is also from the lawn, right? It's not really, it's not good, it's not working anymore. And um, furthermore, the lawn in, in America has to be a very strict regulation height. You can actually get arrested and fined um, in, in parts of Colorado, for example, if your lawn is more than 1.75 inches, which is about three centimeters. Yeah, if your grass is higher than three centimeters, you can get fined. In other words, if your grass doesn't look like what they call over here a jarhead, right, like a sh shaved marine, you know, from the army, then there's a problem. You are a problem. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't also put like psychedelic crucifixes on it and like paintings and outsider stuff. And you shouldn't have like too many flowers growing because that's actually feminizing the space, right? The word, the word lawn, comes from words for clearing and meadow, but funnily enough, the notion of clearing is completely abstract in this modern concept of lawn, right? It's, abs it's just a death space, yeah? And the object is to, you know, mow your lawn, because you're the guy, right? You're the, there's a, so many episodes of the cartoon, King of the Hill, which I couldn't recommend highly enough to watch, about lawn mowers and guys mowing lawns, right? And the idea is you mow the lawn, you destroy all the life forms, and then you sit on your chair and you admire, right? Like a picture. So first of all, you do the death, 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 part of the subject object duality. Then you do the aesthetic contemplation part of the subject object duality, right? If your lawn doesn't look like other people's lawns is also a problem because these lawns are conformists, right? Like we claim to live in a kind of beyond the melting pot salad bowl of multi whatever that is, right? But there are these things in front of people's houses that are out of the 1950s. They have to look exactly the same. And honestly, I'm telling you because I've been threatened. Uh, the guy who ran the properties um, wrote to me and said, you have a deviant. He almost said the word deviant. That's sort of summarizing a paragraph here. And we're gonna do what we need to do to stop your garden from deviating from other people's gardens. Whereupon I had to tell them, look, I." have my own landscape gardener, a, AKA myself, you know, didn't say that. Um, and, you know, I, and I bought myself a hand mower, right? And I, I mow the front with my hand mower, but I letting the back completely just be, 
Yeah. And the reason to do it with the hand mower is because, you know, the part of this is the internal combustion engine, right? The leaf blower, if you drive a combustion engine car for 100 miles, you will emit as many carbon compounds as a leaf blower emits in 20 minutes, right? So, you know, in the supermarket the other day, there was a tropical storm happening. And as usual, there were lots of white men who I'd never seen in the supermarket before piling the supermarket trolley with lots of stuff because somehow they always regress to like the primitive accumulation phase of capitalism. Just build up a massive great big pile. And this time they were kind of just piling it into the, at the expense of other people, you know, who couldn't reach the shelves and they're not fast enough and strong enough and stuff like that. I wrote, you know, like, Instead of panic buying, boys, why don't you panic stop using your leaf blower? Because that would actually be much better to like prevent these kinds of tropical storms from, from, from coming in. Um, and so, yeah, I, I then got um, threatened by these three, two people showed up from the, from, the, from the management company, right? And they, I don't know if you've seen the film Moon, yeah, it's a sci-fi film about a clone. This clone is mining hydrogen on the moon, and he's kind of a defective version of the clones, and he's injured, you know, and he's not, it's not working very well. And he, he reports this, right? And the corporation on Earth sends, we're sending a rescue squad, and this rescue squad is obviously assassins, right? There's like three of them, and their, their heads and their necks are the same thing, and they're like looking like the mugshots, right? And they're kind of like, here we come, you know, to rescue you. Um, the guys who showed up at my door to inspect my house and my garden were these people from Moon. So it seemed to me, you know, that paranoia is a huge, big hobby in Texas. And I, I, can, I, like, I like a little bit of a healthy dose of paranoia, but probably some truth in what I was uh, uh, feeling there. And they had no idea kind of even what a house was. They kind of just walked around like little clockwork toys being, we're looking for leaks. And they weren't, they didn't look, they just kind of moved their heads like this and then they left. And I started to explain about my gardening tactics and why I wanted to rewild things because of global warming and blah, blah, blah. And I suddenly realized, you don't understand a single word that's coming out of my mouth, do you? White people in charge. Now that, that's different from two weeks to three weeks later when these Chicano X people showed up at the door, the actual gardeners, right? Those guys are super intelligent, they care, and they're very articulate, right? So they showed up and they said, we hear that somebody ordered some landscaping. And I'm like, no. And I'm thinking, again, the Texan paranoia with a grain of truth in it. I'm, did some next door neighbor who hates the way I do the gardening all, order this, you know, on behalf, or he needs some landscaping, you know, it's a sort of threat, right? Um, and I said, no, 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 I didn't. In fact, I, did, I profoundly do not agree with the use of internal combustion engine. I'm an ecological philosopher. Please don't do this. And they were like, okay, sure, fine, absolutely. We will make, we'll make a note to not do it. I thought, Thank God some people understand the English language because I was having terrible trouble with their boss, bosses. Yeah. Um, now, the trouble is that this house that I live in is actually owned by the Manil Collection. I don't know if you know the Manil Collection, but... Um, Dominique de Menil and her husband collected an amazing collection of surrealist art and other kinds of art. And they left it in Houston in this beautiful museum across the street called the Menil Collection. And then a little way down the street is a thing called the Rothko Chapel, which is where Mark Rothko painted some of his last paintings and put them up in this chapel. It's absolutely beautiful in there. Um, and so, of course, I've been talking to the Manil Collection about rewilding stuff, right? Could we plant some wildflowers and maybe we could go easy on the internal combustion stuff? And you wouldn't believe the silence at the end of the line when I suggest this. And I've written them maybe four emails. I'm not going to overdo it. But over the course of the last year, I've suggested this and no one's replied. And they do reply to my emails because I know the people who direct, right? And my sense of it is the money who, who funds this, right, um, probably would go crazy or not even understand if they were told what was about to happen. Yeah. Um, Texans who are conservative and wealthy tend to be incredibly tight. You know, Texas is not a tight place. Texas is actually a very loose place, right? But I'm pointing in the direction of the 
About two miles that way are the six billionaires who control the Republican Party. And they all live on a lake, on their own lake, right, in, a, in their own golf course, inside their own forest, inside their own massive stone wall. Like I say, everybody has their own Buckingham Palace here. I'm not joking. Um, down that way live all the people who work, all the people who run the oil corporations, right? So they're the guilty ones. Um, you know, we're all responsible for this, but these are the guilty people. Right? So I'm sort of pointing in these two directions. Um, and I don't think they'd understand, let alone like this idea. And I think that's why the Manil Collection isn't talking to me about it yet. And, you know, so I'm writing a book instead, because, you know, what do you do when you're frustrated and you, you like to write? So you write, right? Um, and I'm finally writing a book that talks about my lawn feelings, because I don't know, you, you don't know this, but everything I've ever written and thought about ecology is actually coming from my visceral reaction to these lawns in Colorado, right? Um, you know the other person who couldn't stand lawns? Saeed Qutb, the guy who started Al-Qaeda? Good idea, Saeed Qutb. He also hated discos. Very bad idea. Yeah. I like discos and I hate lawns, so it's not quite the same. But, but, but Saeed Qutb lived in Greeley, Colorado, right? The guy who inspired Osama bin Laden to do 9-11, the anniversary of which was the other day, lived in northern Colorado. He, he sort of saw what I saw, right? Um, my best friend's dad just died. He's Saudi. And the, the, the approach there, you, you die, then you wrap them in a cloth and you just bury them in the sand. You don't want to, you don't want to uh, waste any time, right? And you're not digging holes in the soil and putting grass over. Traditionally, you're just putting somebody in the sand there. Yeah. So there's not much of a, of a reference point. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I, I've had no success persuading the Manil Collection. So I'm actually going to, I'm actually writing a book now. And the book is called Welcome to the Astrodome. Um, I don't know if you know um, AstroTurf, right? It's a product made by 3M um, and, you know, it's fake grass, right? And there's an Astrodome because the Texas Astros, because of the space rockets, right? Play in, would play in the Astrodome. And talking of lawns, if you go to NASA, which is like, again, I'm pointing vaguely in the direction of NASA, it's like going to a campus of the University of California. And there are these gigantic lawns with like space rockets on them. Yeah. So one of my chapters in this book is going to be called Deep Space. And it's not going to be about space rockets. It's going to be about the fact that the lawns are already sort of out of space to some extent. They're already this void, you know, um, as opposed to the rewilded garden, actually, which is, you know, every time it rains here now, there's like a half a pound of chanterelle mushrooms just show up because they just do, you know, and I'm, and it's, it, wow, right. And then, all these lilies coming up from other people's gardens. There's a pumpkin in there that's growing kind of set. Maybe there's two or three pumpkins growing. Um, it's brilliant. And the horrible grass, which is the default American grass, is, is, is finally being superseded because actually it's not very strong genetically. It's called Kentucky bluegrass. And it, it's literally like a blade. You know the phrase blade of grass? These, these things can give you a finger cut and make you bleed. One of the things that I love about Walt Whitman, right? Like gay poet of the Civil War. He titled his book, Leaves of Grass, right? That's a very deliberate title, right? Like leaves is not the same as blades. And you know, you bet, you've got to pay attention to when a poet talks about plants and flowers because they're always talking about poetry, right? So this, this is a sort of at least talking to this militaristic idea because you see, Unfortunately, agriculture and war are very closely related. And the first ever tanks were actually used as tractors, right? And the phrase, beat your swords into plowshares is kind of amazing, but it's also reversible, right? There's another book of the Bible, I think in the Apocrypha that talks about beating the plowshares back into swords so you can kill people. And there's a reversibility there because it's kind of part of it. And talking of war, this chemical that people spray on lawns, right? Um, Roundup is a chemical nephew of napalm, right? The exfoliant um, made by Monsanto. I, I can't remember who made napalm first, but Roundup's Monsanto, right? It's a, it's a known carcinogen. People are just beginning to admit, apart from in California, where they've been doing this for years, that it's a known carcinogen. And, you know, it just get, makes everything dead. Roundup, think about the word. It's like rounding up cattle, right? And it sounds fun and kind of cowboy. But what are cattle, right? Cattle are, if you look in the dictionary, 
chattels, aka women and slaves, sheep and moo cows, right? As opposed to nature, which is kind of scary and different and over there. Um, stuff that you own, right? And capital, right? That's what the word, that's what the word capital means. Chattels in the sense of patriarchally dominated women and slaves, uh, capital and, and cows and sheep, etc. Farm, farm, farm animals, right? So, so that's what's the, in the word round up. It sort of reminds me of the use of the word daisy cutter. You know, did you ever remember in the first, second Iraq war, they used these bombs called, da they call them daisy cutters. And it's a cute sounding name. But the reason why they're called daisy cutters is that they reduce everything in the blast radius to the height of a daisy, whether it be made of metal or concrete or anything, right? And it's the same kind of principle. It's like, let, let's just erase everything and then it's a blank slate and we can do anything we want on this blank slate, right? It's this concept of terra nullius, you know, the kind of Captain Cook colonialism concept of like, this is our place because it isn't anybody's. And it's this blank sheet that we can do anything to. Yeah. And we must absolutely, with all our might, um, try to like destroy this idea. This is one of the enemies here is, the, is incarnated in the lawn. So many things are. Right. And so I'm hoping that you're going to join me in this association for the abolition of the American lawn. I've got more things to say, but I think I'll stop there and let's talk. Thank you so much uh, for this um, fascinating um, tour de force uh, on lawns, uh, this um, EU critical overview of um, yeah, the the the, pro um, the the problematic uh, on the sides of of, of lawns. I I, um, I can follow you very much, and um, I, I think the the first thing I would like to um, ask you about is um, the the genealogy uh, of lawns because I'm I mean you you talked about this. Um, Al Qaeda guy being provoked by discos and and lawns. Um, there, there, I, I have come across others um, who also have been kind of um, allergic um, to to lawns. Uh, recently, uh, Bruno Latour um, has been provoked by the the idea of of greenness um, as part of of how the planet should be recovered, that there's a kind of sentimentality to, um, to the very uh, project of re-greening nature as if nature is only green. And um, he, he's kind of, um, he, he's provoked by this leaving out of the, the underside, um, the deep underside of the, of, of the lawn um, in, in your terminology uh, being um, earth and, and stone and, and so on. I'm also thinking about the, um, the, the German um, artist, um, um, bio artist to some degree, Thomas Feuerstein, who also has been um, allergic to, to lawns and, and, and inserts them in an interesting genealogy. And it's there, I, I, would, I, I would consult you. Um, um, going back to um, yeah, the Middle Ages and maybe further back um, to, I mean, via the mi Middle Ages, uh, the Hortus Conclusus, also the idea of the, the, the beautiful place, uh, the, the locus amoinus. Um, and then my question to you would be, I mean, uh, you, you have written so interestingly uh, about um, um, us Mesopotamians and, and this acrylic agrologistical project which we are still suffering from and my question would be if 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 the lawn is maybe um the kind of the the idealized version of of nature connected to um agrologistics and maybe initiated in mesopotamia uh, where as far as um i i'm informed the the, the very idea of paradise as this kind of um, a super terranean place um, actually lifted above the ground being um, uh, dislocated both from um, the, 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 the cultivated earth, you know, the, the agrologistical earth on the one hand and on the other, the underworld. So it's this kind of lifting of 
um, some part of nature and then turning it green. And then maybe what you're looking at now is the, the bourgeois version of this. I mean, this kind of patriarchal um, suppression of everything else than this kind of beautified part of nature turning into private property. Um, I don't know what you, what you think of that. Beautifully said. The idea um, uh, of a lawn is kind of paradoxical, right? And it's beautifully expressed actually in, in uh, uh, Crudson's Twilight series. If you ever look at those photographs, it's that somebody's working on the lawn, but they're in their living room, right? And the idea that the lawn is supposed to be this carpet, right? So on the one hand, it's the inside of your house expressed on the outside, right? Um, in an abstract way, right? It's this concept of private property and it's the privacy of your property, right? The quietness and sort of silence of the space, you know, in a funny way, when I think of lawns, I think of Pascal and he goes, the silence in, of these infinite spaces fills me with dread. You know, it's very similar to my reaction to these lawns, you know. Um, but also, as you say, it's also the taking of the outside inside because it's the, the abstract concept of nature as a thing that I can own, um, and ownership meaning I can work on it, right? And the ultimate form of working on it, this is the log theory of labor, right? That formalized in the log theory of labor is that you can destroy it, right? That's what own means. You have the right to get rid of it, right? And so the lawn is the symbol of the, the nature that you got rid of it, but also you preserved the gotten rid of quality, right? But also you're expressing the inside on the outside. So it's this weird kind of ambient in between space in a very not cool way right um and um yes that's, i think that's very beautifully said you know the thing about um green okay so one thing i wanted to say you know how in apocalypse now the guy goes i love the smell of napalm in the morning right well so the you kind of supposed to love the smell of the freshly mown grass in the afternoon right but that smell actually biologically is the grass screaming that's the smell like Butyric acid, which is the sphere sweat smell of a mammal, the grass equivalent is the freshly mown grass. So the fact that you love this smell is very strange because actually it's, this, it's the grass panicking. Yeah. Um, so, so I think, you know, um, this does have a long lineage and it is about the, 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 the concept of nature. And I can see why Bruno's upset about the green. You know, the thing about green, like why are plants green? actually because of symbiosis, right? Because actually they have chloroplasts in them, which are actually evolved from blue-green algae and they do the photosynthesizing. So actually when you're talking about green, you're, what you're really talking about is symbiosis. You're not talking about some kind of flat surface with this color, right? You're talking about the fact that at some point, some single-celled organism was plopping through the ocean and they were like, boom, this is like 3 billion years ago, right? And the first ever possibly life created hyper object was around called oxygen. And it was a pollutant from the anaerobic bacteria's point of view, right? And here's a single cell organism, boom. Oh fuck, did I just swallow poison, right? That's the phenomenology of symbiosis. It's not this kind of certainty and solidity. It's this uncertainty of, did I just, you know, like, is this person going to be the toxic person that makes it impossible for me to have a relationship any, anymore? Like, but that's the, that's the, in that moment, you don't know, right? Several hundreds of millions of years, of years later, some beings are going, actually, that was good because that was an anaerobic bacteria and now we're plants because we evolved into plants and also we're animals because like now we have the mitochondria, it's the same thing, right? So this notion of green, is a kind of reification of that in a certain way, which is why I like to say words like symbiosis and biosphere and why I don't like to say words like nature. So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you brought that up. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the other thing I would, I would um, like to ask you about is um, your, your use of, of the Greek uh, concept um, uh, themos. Um, and you, you, you said, if I understood you correctly, that that um, you would you would prefer this concept um, um, to to a concept like the the, the Greek um, notion of Zoe, 
um, and 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 when when approaching life, I mean life in in as in Black Lives Matter, you you would you would connect to um, to to Themis and not Zoe and and um, I I I mean um, Rosie Bright Dodge has has made uh, I think a really good um, plaidoyer for um, approaching life more broadly via Zoe. So I was I was simply curious to hear why you wanted to not use that concept in order to approach um, um, the life in in for instance Black Lives Matter. People are welcome to use words how they want, and probably there's very strong overlap between what I'm saying and what Rosie's saying. Okay. So I don't want to split hairs about that in particular. The reason why to use thumos is because it's nothing to do with a concept of life. It's just the fact of alive. And what is alive, really? It's this metabolic flow, right? It's things that are moving, right? And a few years ago, I was in this seminar in Berlin on sexuality, and I suddenly realized, I don't know what the word rhythm means. And I've been reading poems for ages, but I don't know what the word rhythm means. You're like, ask to find the word rhythm. You kind of go, well, it's the measurement of, and then you get the word rhythm again. And the definition is circular. It's like, like high definitions of time, right? Time is a measurement of what, right? So what is that thing actually that, that rhythm actually is, yeah? So I look up the words and look up the words. And the first syllable is from the word flow, like diarrhea, right? Um, and um, the second syllable is from this word thumos, which is pulsation. So actually, without being measured, what rhythm actually is, is the pulsation of the body fluids. That's what rhythm is, right? It's your heart and your, that's why you point to this, right? It's, and, 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 and to have that pulsation, there's gotta be these gaps and holes, right? When you do an echocardiogram of the heart, it's like you're feeling as a way of seeing, right? And you feel your way into making this echocardiogram um, and, and when you see this, it's a very moving experience to see an echocardiogram. Um, and what you're seeing there is this kind of trembling fibrillation, right? Like, why do you even have a heart attack? Because your heart is already going, right? Then it can kind of get funky a little bit because there's, there's an A and a B. That's why they call beta blockers. There's a backup mechanism, right? That can get out of phase with the other one, right? from a very, very far away, conceptually speaking, very, very low resolution JPEG, they're going gun, 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 gun. the Pink Floyd sort of heartbeat sound. But when you get up super close, they're going sort of rippling, right? When you get up close to any matter, you know, in, a, in super, super cold and therefore isolated and in a vacuum, right, near to absolute zero, what's it doing? It's going like that, right? That's alive. Yeah. And this doesn't just apply to distinctions between things that are alive and not alive. Right. Like like a pencil you think isn't alive or a snail you think is alive. Right. And this does not imply any kind of legalistic distinction between what counts as alive. It's much more importantly, the feeling of alive, which is what used to be what literary studies was about. And also what I think genuinely, when you take the patriarchy and all that out of that concept, that's what also theory is about, because the theory feeling, right, everything has a feeling, right, to me is the same as the meditation feeling, which is like, what if I was wrong? You know, what if, what if, what if, you know, what's, what next? Yeah, movement, right? You know, you, when you meditate, you realize everything's moving. It's, you, you, you never achieve stasis. You might achieve some kind of stillness. But the stillness enables you to notice everything's actually flowing all the time, right? Um, and that feeling of like, what is life? It kind of, it is life, right? The question that Shelley asked at the end of this amazing poem that he's written called The Triumph of, then what is life, I cried, you know, kind of that is it, right? And like, um, what does it mean to be alive is the answer to its own question. Yeah, but it's also the symbiosis feeling. Right, it's the feeling of uncertain, kind of uncertainly relating to something that could be poison. Yeah, you don't know yet. If you want to know, you have to build a wall and start interrogating people, and soon you've become the previous president of the USA. 
Yes, um, I, I was also wondering, um, talking about uh, uh, Themos, um, uh, that that um, Alexander Kostiev, um, when when giving his, his lectures on, on Hegel, uh, very much focused on this concept. I mean, the desire for for Themos in Hegel as a kind of driving force in 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 history. Um, Mm. Is there any undertone of that in, in your use of that? Well, wow. I'm so glad you've raised that issue because this is the trouble with the Hegel. Yeah. I like little bits of things, right? Like, so I like songs and riffs and bits of lyrics, and I tend not to like big or everything, right? And I like the bit of Hegel that's all about like ideas like hammers and tennis rackets and drugs come with ways of consuming them, right? You have to handle them in a certain way for them to work, right? And studying the way you handle them is the point. This is the phenomenology of spirit. What I don't like about the Hegel is the teleology, or as you say, the drive, right? That we're going from A to B, right? That's actually unnecessary and violent. And the trouble is, you know, that Hegel is like white supremacy imperialism, I feel, in philosophy form. And I believe Marx only was a Hegelian because he was gaslit by the German education system, because he kind of had to be one to be cool. Right. When you can perfectly well be a Marxist without the Hegel, you have to get used to realizing that, like all life forms, are part of the revolutionary project. But what's not to like about that? And sometimes you have to sound a little bit like Yoda because you're beginning to like realize that causality doesn't have a Ford's gear and it's kind of implicatedly intertwined with and actually is the aesthetic dimension, aka the force. You know, so you kind of have to like tolerate that a little bit. But I'd rather tolerate sounding like Yoda and allowing hedgehogs to wear little Che Guevara hats than to have this stupid idea that the point is to go from A to B, right? That, you know, the slinky, that American toy that kind of flop, that's beautiful, right? That's like the Hegelian dialectic. But the Hegel is like the slinky can go upstairs. And at the top of the stairs is Hegel, you know, in the Prussian state circa 1807, it's like, whoop de doo I, I didn't see that coming. You know, sarcastically, There's, you're allowed to laugh sometimes when I say crazy stuff, by the way. Um, so, you know, the, the, this notion that Thumos is drive is no, but why can you have a heart attack? Because it isn't that. It's not trying to live. It's just blah, 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 right. So, so to me, it's also like the uh, idea that at bottom, um, quantum theoretical things are just moving without being pushed. Right, it's called vibration. Right, it's like being moving with an amplitude and a frequency, but not because you got pushed by anything. Right, that to me is like what 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 this word is kind of conveying. Right, so it's nothing to do with drive, really. It's not to do with like get, get, getting from A to B somehow. It's it's like a vibration. Okay, thanks. I think maybe we should um, um, go to a, a, a few questions from the audience. And there's first. Uh, one from an anonymous, uh, anonymous attendee um, saying, Timothy, could you elaborate further why you felt you wouldn't write hyper objects in present times? Sure. Um, I think it would be, I think it would feel really oppressive. You know, I would at least change the subtitle. You know, it's lovely to have a word for something, right? It's great to have a word for something. Don't get me wrong. I love this word hyper object. It's, really, it's doing a lot of stuff, right? But I think I'd write something a bit different now because, you know, so for example, I was talking to Extinction Rebellion Youth in London a couple of years ago. And I said, by the way, the title of this book is Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World. Now, we all know probably what that really means, which is philosophy after the end of white guys thinking that they own the place. Right. But, you know, people are allowed to interpret it how they want. And they said, these 17 year old, 15 year old people, they were like, you can't say that to us. You can't say the world is, is, has ended. You, 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 know, you shouldn't say that. You know, we already feel like we want to die. I don't know if you've spoken to Generation Z recently, but high school people, they want to die. You know, and like one of my favorite hobbies is making sure they don't feel like that in the morning. So I would not write this book that way now. Also, it's very scary and intense, you know, and like we don't need any more scary and intense. Okay, we don't need any more shocking. We don't need any more oh my God, is this real kind of thing? It's like, yeah, it is. And part of that is a little bit of a boy reaction to like, oh my God, did I come out of a vagina? You know, so the, the basis of the uncanny, the Freudian uncanny is your 
physical embodiment as a biological being, you came from somewhere, you know, maybe you came from a test tube or the somewhere else in the biosphere, but you came out of something else, right? And that's the freak out. And I think, you know, white boys have got about five seconds to freak out like that, because pretty much everyone else on the planet already knows this stuff. And like a lot of ecological awareness and politics is, is like white boys think going through the same thing that everyone else has been going through for hundreds of years because of them, you know. So I don't think I'd write it this way anymore. I, th I think there's enough of this shocking stuff. It's called hurricane this and fire that. And, you know, like we, we're bursting into flame and drowning here, you know, and we don't need a single another. So I did this work of art a few years ago. It was a road sign and it said, we are the asteroid, right? And the, and the American artist, a New York artist, slightly pushy, speedy Amer New York, did never understand why the next, to use the next phrase, which was, you're not guilty, right? We are the asteroid only works if there's this other phrase saying that you're not guilty, you're not guilty. And I would never do this, we are the asteroid approach, right? That's hyper objects encapsulated in a single phrase, right? Like we're standing here having this conversation, but on another scale, we're hurtling towards earth at 30,000 miles an hour, we're about to impact, right? Now that's like, don't, you, you shouldn't say that anymore. That's not cool. Thank you. Maybe we, we have time for just uh, one more question. It's coming from Klaus Sortsu and she asks, might the obsession with keeping and regulating the lawn be a form of coping mechanism or an expression of denial um, in the face of environmental decline to tend your own lawn while the world burns, the irony in using a compacted and regulated version of ecology to ignore a greater ecological disaster? Well, you know, um, two things. First of all, masculinity in general is a kind of obsessive compulsive performance because it doesn't work, right? Like masculinity as such is toxic, right? So lawn stuff is always a kind of co absolutely spot, spot on. I'm not coping and achieving a state of like, I'm Zen and calm now because everybody's bursting into flame by doing this other thing. I'm working on this scale and I'm also trying to work on this other scale. Like I'm talking to about a hundred people right now. Hello everybody. And you know, we should do global action. Black Lives Matter is awesome because it's global planet scale politics when me too, right? Arriving just in time, right? And coronavirus is planet scale human being awareness. Right. And as Carla Lonzi says in a book called Let's Spit on Hegel, the feminism is planetary, not just international. Right. So, you know, we got to work on all these different scales at once. And these scales are overlapping. And I refuse the cynicism of just, well, I'm just going to do nothing and, you know, feel good about myself for having done nothing as, ever, as, ever, as everything bursts into flame. It doesn't really work because I'm saying that in the context of being in a biosphere. So I can never really achieve escape velocity from my physical embodiment enough to be cynical like that, right? Plus, yeah, I'm gonna make my lawn safe for frogs, right? Like there are these frogs now, they hop around inside the grass because they're safe. And you don't see that across my street, right? I'm not doing this to feel good, right? You, you should be now screaming inside, right? Like the appropriate reaction to what's going on is a blood curdling shriek, you know, and weeping and I just started to learn how to grieve, you know, like grief is really important because grief is your past giving your future a massage, right? It's this inner body worker that's basically saying, look, I know this doesn't really work in Western culture, but lie down on your bed in the fetal position and I'm just going to like squeeze your abs for a while and you're going to feel like you're going to throw up. But actually, you know, something will happen and then I'll leave you and drink lots of water and then I'll come visit you again. One of the greatest things my friend Laurie Anderson did when she visited Houston a couple of years ago, she took about 50 Gen Z people through Yoko Ono's scream piece. I thought that was a really great, responsible, grown-up thing to do, right? Yoko Ono's like, scream at the top of your lungs for 30 seconds. So she got these Gen Z people to go, ah, like that. And like, they, this is really, this is the, you know, and she was modeling that, right? And I'm modeling that. I'm not modeling be all calm and zen. That sucks. Okay, um, I think that um, time is running out and we should go to our second um, lecturer. But thank you so much for this fascinating lecture and your thought-provoking um, answers to the questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you.